I'm your host, Dr. Roberta Westbrook, and you're here with us at the Campus for All Animals, the Houston SPCA, and we have a lot of wonderful information for you today. Today, I want to talk to you about an infectious disease that affects cats, and it's known as feline panleukopenia, also known as feline parvovirus. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. If you've heard of it, and even if you haven't heard of it, Think of some questions that you can put in the chat and hopefully I can help you and protect your cats from this disease. Now, in the meantime, I'd love to introduce you to our pet of the week this week. This is Kulfi. Kulfi is a five month old female spade kitten. She's so adorable. She's very playful, very charismatic. And Kulfi came to us just as a small little kitten. She was too young for adoption. And so she was in a foster home until she was old enough to go up for adoption and until she was healthy. And Kofi is now five months old and ready to find her new home. So please come on down and meet Kofi and all of our other dogs and cats and puppies and kittens that we have available for adoption. We even have rabbits. So if you're interested in small mammals, we have those as well. Uh, we're open every day from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. So come on down and join us. So now let's talk about feline panleukopenia virus. Now let's start with um, that, that name, feline, cat, and then panleukopenia. It's a very long, interesting name. So what does that mean? Pan, if we want to separate that, pan means all, and leuco means white, and penia means small. And so what we're talking about is a decrease in all the white blood cells in the cat's body. And so feline panleukopenia can affect the, the body by causing a low white blood cell count. And usually that's due to overwhelming infection that's occurring in the body from this particular virus. And that's how it gets its name, feline panleukopenia. And how does it attack the body? So very interesting. This is a virus and it's actually called a parvovirus. So you may have heard of parvovirus before in dogs. Well, this particular type of parvovirus is transmitted through what we call fecal oral transmission. It's usually ingested. The virus is shed in the feces and cats can be uh, come into contact with those feces outdoors or in their enclosure. And then when they're licking and grooming themselves, they may ingest those microscopic virus particles. So that's how it gets in. Now this particular virus, a parvovirus, lives in the intestines and it sets up shop in the intestines and begins to replicate and to affect the lining of the intestines. And when it does that, one of the things that it causes is um, severe irritation of the lining of the intestines. And what we see as veterinary professionals and as uh, pet owners is diarrhea. And so one of the most uh, common causes or sorry, symptoms of feline panleukopenia is actually diarrhea. Awesome. And so what other symptoms could there be? Or is it just like that one uh, main one? You know, diarrhea is the, the most common, but oftentimes the diarrhea may have blood in it. So sometimes the lining of the intestine is so irritated that blood is seen in the stool. Usually cats and kittens that have feline panleukopenia are lethargic. They may vomit. They may lose their appetite and not want to eat or drink. And so these are the most common signs. They're predominantly gastrointestinal signs. Um, we certainly can see other signs related to feline panleukopenia when the kittens are infected, when they're very, very young, often in utero. And an interesting thing about that is if the kittens are infected with this virus while they're in utero, while, while they're still inside the uh, queen's uterus, it can actually inhibit the development of their cerebellum. And so the cerebellum is a part of the brain that controls gait <laughs> and coordination. And when these kittens are born, as they grow older, they oftentimes have what we call ataxia, meaning they are very wobbly in their gait and they seem very uncoordinated and they fall over a lot. Um, and that happens only when this virus affects them while the cerebellum is being developed. We call that cerebellar hypoplasia. 
So cerebellar hypoplasia plasia means that the cerebellum is underdeveloped. So again, just to summarize, some of the symptoms that we see are ataxia, like a wobbly gait, secondary to cerebellar hypoplasia. We see vomiting, we see diarrhea, and lethargy because the virus is affecting the intestines. And then when the veterinarian runs blood work, we also see that the white blood cells in the blood are low. And that's usually because there's so much infection going on. And so is that how it's diagnosed just from the symptoms in the low blood cell or is there a specific test that gets run too? Great question. So oftentimes we will go off of the symptoms, but there is a test and the test is easy to perform and it only takes 10 minutes to get those results. It requires a fresh stool sample, but generally um, the veterinarian and veterinary staff will take a fresh stool sample and they will mix it um, with a particular type of conjugate or liquid and put it on a test plate and it takes about 10 minutes to run and we can get our answer. All right, and then what are the treatment options, if any? So ideally, we would find this disease very early on. If we if we find it and begin treatment early on, they cats usually have a very good prognosis. Um, generally, it requires antibiotic treatment because again, we're dealing with um, infection. Although this is a virus, oftentimes there's secondary bacteria that can cause some of the symptoms, and so we will use antibiotics. We will also give fluids to keep the patients hydrated and nutritional support. The idea is to keep the intestines healthy, to provide good nutrients, good hydration, and time letting that virus take its course. And so does it take usually about a few days or a few weeks until we know like it's clear? Yeah, great question. It depends on how soon we've identified this virus and how severe the symptoms are, but certainly some patients can make dramatic improvement in a positive way just in a few days of treatment and some may take up to two weeks typically we consider this um, something that we like to treat for a full two weeks and when the virus is clear um, are they still contagious to other to other cats so there is a shedding period for this virus um, and so typically that shedding period is early on when they're symptomatic um, so it's important to talk to your veterinarian about when your pet may be clear to play with other um, cats to make sure that they're not in the shedding phase of this disease. Typically, that's early on. And so it's, if it's been several weeks, they typically are not shedding that virus anymore. And so, like, I guess it is contagious during that shedding period. Yes. And so can other cats be, you know, homed in the, in the pet is recovering from Panluc or having Panluc? Yes, what I would recommend is if you have a cat in your home that currently is being treated or under treatment for panleukopenia, that you isolate the cat. That's what uh, we do in veterinary hospitals, that any contagious disease, you really want to isolate the pet from any other healthy pets just to prevent the spread of this disease. Again, it can be spread through the feces and then through subsequent ingestion of those microscopic particles. So isolating the pet is gonna be the best way to prevent that spread. And how else can this virus be pre prevented? Yes, the best way to prevent this is to vaccinate. So vaccinating your pets is important. Starting um, very early on, um, usually around six to eight weeks is when veterinarians typically begin vaccinating pets. So take your new kitten to the veterinarian, um, get a full checkup, and you can get a panleukopenia test if you're noticing that your, your cat is showing signs of diarrhea, lethargy, and or vomiting. And so can a vaccinated cat still contract the virus? You know, vaccines are not 100% effective. We, we are careful to say that vaccines prevent 100% of infections, but generally, given in the right frequency, the right time, and at the right age, they should prevent the uh, contraction of panleukopenia. And if we want to bring in our pets to get tested or to get those vaccinations, where can we go? So we can go, you can come to our pet wellness clinic. Um, if you think that your pet is showing symptoms of feline panleukopenia or any GI upset, vomiting, diarrhea, you can certainly come see us here on the campus of the Houston SPCA at our pet wellness clinic, um, and we can help get your pet a physical exam. And if we suspect that maybe your kitten is suffering from an infection with the feline parvovirus that causes panleukopenia, we can certainly run that test and get you started on that treatment.
All right. And then, of course, you can get the vaccinations there, too, to prevent it. <laughs> Absolutely. We also provide vaccines and deworming and all of your preventive pet needs so that your pets can live long, healthy lives. All right. If you want, if we want to adopt an already vaccinated pet, where can we go? Yes, please come on down to our adoption center. If you are ready to consider taking a pet into your home, please come on down. We're open every day, Monday, uh, Monday through Sunday, every day from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. There's no appointment necessary, and we have a wonderful adoption staff that can help you find the right pet for your lifestyle. So please come on down and visit us. We're happy to see you and be a part of our extended family. Uh, please consider going to HoustonSPCA.org and consider ways to give. We would love to have you as part of our extended family in the way of financial support, or maybe donating your time um, or volunteering here on campus. We, we would love to have you in any capacity that you're willing to help us. And as always, we will see you next week on the Pet Podcast. Bye. -bye.